late 1918, a young British naval officer was off the coast of Africa when word reached him that the war was over. News of the Allied victory brought Harold Owen a curious sense of sadness. It bothered me that I could not, to myself, account for my restless unease. I felt horribly flat. I stared out over the incredibly blue expanse of glittering sea. And perhaps something in the limitless stretch of water and sky affected me. I realized surge of happiness that the war had not broken my own family. My brother Wilfred must be all right now. He was safe, and so was I. But soon after, as Owen walked to his cabin, he had a premonition about his brother, who had been fighting in France. I had gone down to my cabin to write some letters. I drew aside the door curtain and stepped inside. I felt shock run through me with appalling force. To my amazement, I saw Wilfred sitting in spoke quietly. Wilfred, how did you get here? He did not rise and I saw he was immobile, but his eyes were alive with the familiar look of trying to make me understand. I must have turned my eyes away from him. When I looked back, my cabin chair was empty. I felt an overpowering sense of absolute loss. I knew with certainty that Wilfred was dead. Why did he have to die? More than a month later, I received a letter confirming what he already knew. His brother Wilfred was dead. He had been killed in action in the last week of the war. Harold would be haunted by the question, why, from that day on. The search for an answer would cast a shadow over his life and the lives of an entire generation of survivors. For them, the Great War would be a war without end. The stage is set, the destiny disclosed. It has come about by no plan of our conceiving, but by the hand of God who led us into this way. We cannot turn back. The light streams upon the path ahead and nowhere else. Woodrow Wilson had an answer to the question of why so many had died. For him, the Great War was the war to end all wars. His vision of global democracy had met with thunderous applause when he arrived at the Paris Peace Conference at the end of the war. But by the time he left Europe in 1919, most of the cheering crowds were gone. His dreams, too, had been whittled down to their barest essential. A League of Nations to ensure world peace. The League, Wilson declared, was the only way to justify 
the carnage of the war. If the League of Nations should ever be impaired, I would get the boys who went across the water to fight and I would say, boys, I told you before you went across the seas that this was a war against wars. But I'm obliged to come to you in mortification and shame and say, you are betrayed. You fought for something that you did not get. Wilson had decided to risk his political life on the League of Nations. But he lacked enough votes in Congress to pass the treaty. Rather than compromise with his political opponents, he told his wife Edith he would bypass Congress and make an appeal directly to the American public. Towards the end of August, he said that as a last resort, he must go to the country to explain to the people what failure to ratify would mean. This proposed trip was stoutly opposed by Dr. Grayson, his physician, who did not think the president could draw further on his strength without risking disaster. Along with his political strength, Wilson's health was failing. He fumbled with note cards when making speeches. His memory was no longer sharp. And now he faced a grueling coast-to-coast -coast train tour. But his life mattered little, he told his wife, compared to the treaty. To my dying day, I shall esteem it the crowning privilege of my life to have been permitted to put my name to a document like this. I want to say that this is an unparalleled achievement of thoughtful civilization. The heart of humanity beats in this document. It is a liberation of the peoples and of the human forces of the world. The cities and states came and went. Wilson began to have headaches so severe that he could barely speak. 23 days into the presidential tour, his train pulled out of Pueblo, Colorado. Neither Wilson nor his wife knew it, but he had just made his last public speech. I found him sitting on the side of his bed. He said he had tried to sleep, but the pain had grown unbearable. In the fight of his political life, Wilson was felled by a stroke. Nothing the doctor could do gave relief. The dear face opposite me was drawn and lined. As I sat there watching the dawn break slowly, I felt that life would never be the same. We left for Washington. That night, was the longest and most heartbreaking of my life. He's stricken with what appears to be, uh, in medical terms, a transient ischemic attack in Colorado. He returns to the White House and has a much larger stroke, apparently, some days after his return. Uh, leaves him partially paralyzed, thick of speech, uh, 
uh, unable to appear in public for many, many months. And it's in that condition that he has to somehow or other uh, muster his troops for the final battle in the Senate on behalf of the treaty. The White House was reorganized as a hospital. Months passed before Wilson was well enough to carry out his duties. But he made one message clear. He would accept no amendments to his cherished treaty. His grasp on reality was probably not as sure as it would have been under other circumstances. And his medical condition no doubt reinforced a kind of self-righteous and rigid uh, characteristic in his personality that rendered him even more incapable than he might otherwise have been uh, of compromise. He did not compromise. The treaty was voted down. The defeat left Wilson's vision of world peace as broken as the president. Wilson served out the rest of his term an invalid. He died in 1924, as much a casualty of the war as any soldier who fell on the battlefield. farewell to civilization with an air of finality while Wilmot performed on an upright piano. We all became confidential and almost emotional. At such a moment as that, the war felt quite a friendly affair. As horrible as the war was, it was an experience that many people found positive, productive, and worthwhile. They came out very attached to their experience of the war, thinking that this was the best time of their lives, uh, that they had experienced comradeship with other men that they had never even thought possible before. And for many of these men, the road back was just very, very difficult. The road back was especially difficult for the British poet Siegfried Sassoon. Throughout his life, he would try to write of other things, but he always found himself returning to the war. The man who endured the war at its worst was everlastingly differentiated from everyone, except his fellow soldiers. Many rarely saw what they had seen. But the maimed had no way of disguising their scars of war. An army of the walking wounded were turned home to societies ill-equipped to deal with the traumas of war. An American military film tried to show how even amputees might still enjoy a game of baseball. Does it matter losing your legs? For people will always be kind. And you need not show that you mind when the others come in after hunting to gobble their muffin and eggs. Does it matter losing your sight? There's such splendid work for the blind. 
And the people will always be kind as you sit on the terrace remembering and turning your face to the light. Do they matter, those dreams from the pit? You can drink and forget and be glad. And people won't say that you're mad, for they'll know that you fought for your country. And no one will worry a bit. Among the most tragic victims of the war were what the French called the men with broken faces. One who helped these men cope with their injuries was the British orderly Ward Muir. Hideous is the only word for these smashed faces. The skewed mouth, and worse, far the worst, the incredibly brutalizing effects which are the consequences of wounds in the nose. To talk to a lad who six months ago was probably a wholesome and pleasing specimen of English youth, and is now a gargoyle, is an ordeal. These were the soldiers who continued to show what suffering in the trenches had meant. They were a continuous reminder of what they had gone through in the gas attack, in the bombardment, in being buried for hours uh, under the earth and being uh, at the brink of psychological collapse. And many of the population did not like to face these war cripples. They did not wish to be remembered continuously of what war was really like. And these bodies were really sites of remembrance. When medical science failed to help these mutilated men, artisans took over. The skills of the sculptor were called upon in special clinics. Using pre-war photos of the patients, sculptors fashioned thin masks to cover the worst wounds. It is difficult to convey a fair impression of the extraordinary sort of precision with which these membrane-like but strong metal masks adhere to the face and cover the grisly gap beneath them. Figure what this means to the patient. Instead of being a gargoyle ashamed to show himself on the streets, he is almost a normal human being and can go anywhere unafraid. Self-respect returns to him, his depression departs. Concealing war wounds was one way of coping with a war that refused to go away. Bringing attention to them was another. The German artist, Otto Dix, knew what disfigurement did to a man. He had been a soldier during the war and was now suffering from nightmares. I'm obsessed with the devil. That is how I know what's up in the world. He painted, he said, to rid himself of the demons of war. After the war, he's actually painting the effects of the war on human bodies. Really, the psychological effect as well, and, and the mental de devastation on the human being, but he images it in the flesh in this really crude, deliberately grotesque manner, because he really wants to shock people. The effects of war are when you see somebody with half their face scoured away walking down the street and you try and look away. The people were already beginning to forget what unspeakable suffering the war had brought with it. It's not the task of artists to correct and convert. They are much too small for that, but they must give their testimony. <laughs> 
Dick's painted what he saw around him. Former soldiers reduced to selling matches on the street. Disfigured amputees with horrid head and facial wounds. And women who chose prostitution over starvation. Once the war is over, the prostitute and the war cripple are the two most trenchant ways in which you could actually image on a human body the horrors and the degradation of the war. So he implies that the brutalizing done to, the, to you, whether as a soldier or as a prostitute in that war, was, was savage and real. Dix's things also document growing feelings of anti-Semitism. In this painting, a German amputee rolls over a pamphlet announcing Juden raus, Jews out. It was another disfigurement plaguing Germany after the war. As time passed, the battlefields of the Great War became hallowed ground. They were sites of pilgrimage. Thousands tried to retrace the footsteps of their loved ones. Was there an answer here for the question why so many had died? Those that came soon after the war found the landscape still an open wound, the trenches still littered with human remains. One who wandered across these fields of desolation in 1920 was the British journalist Stephen Graham. The stagnancy has not dried up but festers still in the black rot below the rushes. Double shell holes, charred ground, great pits. What is it now? The abode of rats, lizards, weasels, unexploded stick bombs, rusty grog bottles, Helmets lie there still in plenty. There are broken rifles. There are graves. Death and the ruins completely outweigh the living. There is a pull from the other world. What, Graham asked, had it all meant? The enormity of the destruction and death. Like a modern Hamlet, he found the answers elusive. Lying in an old trench, behold, a skull. It is clean and a soldier's head. There is a frayed hole in an otherwise perfect cranium. The simplest way to pick it up would be to put a finger in the eye hole and lift it. Friend or foe. The more you look at the skull, the more angry does it seem. It has an intense, eternal grievance. This one does not grin, for the mouth has been destroyed. It is just blind and senseless, forever and ever. By 1922, the battlefields were cleared and national cemeteries for the dead of the Great War.
But the pull from the other world still held millions of survivors in its grip. One was Katie Kollwitz, one of the great artists of her time. In the first days of the war, she had watched her 19-year-old son, Peter, march off to fight. He was killed on his second day in battle. I knew it all even then. I sat on the bed and wept, wept, wept. Where do all these women find the courage to send their dear ones to the front to face the guns when they have watched over them all their lives with loving care? Kolwitz's art had always portrayed the hardships of the anguished. With the death of her son, she joined them. She tried to express her grief by creating a monument to her dead son. But her guilt made the task so painful that she put it aside for years at a time. Is it a break of faith with you, Peter, if I can only see madness in this war? But I shall do this work for you and for the others. Dear Peter, I ask you then to be around me. Help me. Show yourself to me. The real impetus comes when she visits the graveyard in Belgium, where her son's remains were placed in 1926. And she goes and she decides the only thing she can do for this sea of crosses is two figures of her husband and herself. And she chooses this mourning, grieving father and the grieving mother who she places in the center of this graveyard so that they encompass, they grieve for every young man who lay in that field. And when she goes to install it in 1932, she describes in a letter home how she goes to look at it, then she goes to her son's grave, and then she walks back to her own image and she weeps, and she strokes the cheeks of the figure she's carved to look like herself with her own tears. And it seems to me that that reconciliation, that redemption, is what that statue's about. My husband stood close behind me. I heard him whisper, yes. How close we were to one another then. Katie Kollwitz could visit her son's grave. But what of the millions less fortunate? Those who could not afford to make the journey? Or those whose sons had vanished without a trace? <laughs> 
In Britain, the government's solution was the unveiling of a memorial in the heart of London, an empty tomb called the Cenotaph. It commemorated the nearly one million dead of the British Empire. But for some, this gesture was not enough. They sought relief in a growing movement called spiritualism. In the presence of an agonized world, hearing every day of the deaths of the flower of our race and the first promise of their unfulfilled youth, see down one the wives and mothers who had no clear conception where their loved ones had gone. I seemed suddenly to see that it was really something tremendous, a breaking down of the walls between two worlds, a direct, undeniable message from beyond, a call of hope and of guidance to the human race at the time of its deepest affliction. Arthur Conan Doyle, the creator of Sherlock Holmes, was one of the leaders of spiritualism. He had lost several loved ones in the war, including his son, Kingsley. Like others, Conan Doyle found hope in the possibility of communication with the dead. Conan Doyle believed that the third image floating above his head was that of his son, In the wake of the Great War, millions were caught up in the spiritualist resurgence. Spiritualism gave people a chance to have a ritual interment of members of their family whose graves were not known or who had literally been blown to pieces. Maybe half of the men who were killed in the First World War had no known graves. The families had no place to go through the rituals of separation. A seance was one of them. Six of us, all personal friends, sat in a semicircle. My wife being left. Presently, a voice came quite close to my face. Both my wife and I cried out that it was our boy. He began to talk. He tried to console me for his death. I asked, are you happy? He answered, I am happy now. He put his strong, heavy hand on my head and pressed as solidly as possible. And I can assure you that he left me a good deal happier than he found me. Communicating with the dead was the way Conan Doyle dealt with his pain. He gave up writing Sherlock Holmes stories altogether, but he never escaped the shadow of loss. Spiritualism was one way of coping with the war. The new medium of motion pictures was another. And in its own way, the cinema was also able to raise the dead. Most portrayals of the war were pure spectacle, but powerful statements were also made. One of the first was a French film, J'accuse. I accuse. 
The director was Abel Gantz. Because of bad health, he was turned down for military service, while many of his friends died on the battlefield. He decided to express his anger by making a film even as the war was still being fought. Remarkably, Gantz had the help of the French army. What he did to get French army cooperation was to make it appear to be a justification of war, extremely patriotic, in fact chauvinistic, so that he had tremendous war backing. And then one day he was doing the opening titles with thousands of French soldiers forming the title J'accuse. And a French general said, um, by the way, what are you uh, accusing? He said, I'm accusing the war. I'm accusing man. I'm accusing universal stupidity. The film's hero, like Gantz himself, was horrified by the war. While standing in a cemetery, he witnesses the dead rise from their graves. Not to comfort the living, but to pass judgment on them. And the corpses come to life and march through the country streets into the villages to ask, has our death been worthwhile? And the hero runs terrified ahead of them, warning the inhabitants, grabbing them and saying, For God's sake, what have you been doing since your husband died? You know, how many men have you been living with? You're going to your husband any minute. And it was so powerful that in some places, certainly in England, uh, women fainted and had to be taken out of the cinema. These ghosts were not actors. They were actual soldiers on furlough. Gantz called his cast the dead on leave. After filming the movie, many of these men died in battle. These haunting images are the last visual memories of them. J'accuse stands to this day as a powerful statement about war. But in Germany, the idea of accusation would be put to an entirely different purpose. The march home from the war was a lingering, bitter memory for German soldiers. They had come back as an army, defeated but unbowed. Many believed they had been betrayed at home, stabbed in the back. In the last days of the war, a young corporal was recovering in a hospital. Adolf Hitler had been gassed and was temporarily blinded. It was then that a local pastor broke the news of the armistice. When the old gentleman began to tell us that we were throwing ourselves at the mercy of the victors, I could stand it no longer. tottered and groped my way back to the dormitory, threw myself on my bunk and dug my burning head into my blanket and pillow. And so it had all been in vain. In vain all the sacrifices and privations. In vain the hunger and thirst of months which were often endless. In vain the deaths of two million who died. Was this 
the sacrifice which the German mother made to the fatherland when with sore heart she let her best loved boys march off never to see them again? Hatred grew in me. Hatred for those responsible for this deed. In the days that followed, my own fate became known to me. I decided to go into politics. The last days of the war were the first days of Adolf Hitler's crusade. The war is a turning point, and as he sits there in 1918, eyes swathed in bandages, hearing that Germany has lost the war, he is absolutely mesmerized and appalled and dumbstruck that this could have happened. The political career thereafter is in some ways, it begins almost immediately, an attempt to find uh, those responsible, the November criminals, uh, for the stab in the back. Would not the graves of all the hundreds of thousands open? The graves of those who with faith in the fatherland had marched forth never to return? Would they not open and send the silent mud and blood-covered heroes back as spirits of vengeance to the homeland which had cheated them with such mockery? It's absolutely impossible to understand Hitler without the First World War. He was a creature of the war. He embodies so many characteristics of the generation of 1914. He was driven by the same sort of nostalgia for the experience of the trenches, for the comradeship of the trenches. Hitler reveled in the memory of the Great War. His first political allies were fellow veterans. Among them, the former commander of Germany's army, Erich Ludendorff. What these old soldiers shared was the conviction that it was not the army that had lost the war, but Germans at home. Hitler provided the scapegoat. Jewish radicals who had sparked revolution during and after the war. If at the beginning and during the war, someone had only subjected about 12 or 15,000 of those Hebrew destroyers of the poison gas, as was suffered on the battlefield by hundreds of thousands of our best workers from all social classes and all walks of life, then the sacrifice of millions at the front would not have been in vain. Hitler came to power in 1933. He quickly began imprisoning communists and Jews and treated them like enemies on the battlefield. Hitler could not have done what he did without the First World War. It isn't the Second World War that created images of piles of bodies being shoveled into trenches. It's the First World War. So as it were, what was thinkable, what was imaginable about human brutality changed between 1914 and 1918? And without that shifting of perspective, in my view, the worst events of the Second World War would not have been possible. The clear red blood of Germany had to flow, declared one Nazi, until the country was purified. Industrial slaughter 
born in one world war took on an even more terrible form in the second. to the Second World War, as the Allies bombed Berlin, the artist Katie Kollwitz fled the city. It is incomprehensible to me what degrees of endurance people can manifest. In days to come, people will hardly understand this age. If the First World War began blurring the distinction between and civilian targets. The Second World War erased it. For both sides, the bombing of cities became commonplace. What a difference between now and 1914. People have been transformed so that they have this capacity for endurance. Worst of all, is that every war already carries within the war that will answer it. Every war is answered by a new war until everything, everything is smashed. Six days before her death in 1945, wrote her last letter. War, she declared, accompanies me to the end. The same could be said for the generation of great war survivors. Others we have met in this series, like the Australian Cyril Lawrence, put on a uniform again in World War II. So did the Frenchman, Henri Desaignon. The survivor of Verdun lived to see the liberation of France. Otto Dix was drafted into the German Civil Guard. He was captured by the French and survived the war. Harry Truman, who had fired the last shots of the First World War also gave the command to drop the atomic bomb on Japan, ending the second. Vera Britton became a pacifist. She took the unpopular stand of opposing strategic bombing in the Second World War. The former Kaiser Wilhelm II died in the midst of World War II. He spent the last days of his life chopping wood with his one good arm. Siegfried Sassoon continued to revisit the trenches of the Great War in his poetry and prose. He died in 1967, still a soldier in his mind and his memories. He couldn't forget but feared the rest of us would. Have you forgotten yet? For the world's events have rumbled on since those gag days, like traffic checked while at the crossing of city ways. But the past is just the same and war's a bloody game. Have you forgotten yet? Look down and swear by the slain of the war that you'll never forget. Do you remember the dark months you held the sector at Mametz? The nights you watched and wired and
pile sandbags on parapets? Do you remember the rats? And the stench of corpses rotting in front of the frontline trench? And dawn coming, dirty white, and chill with a hopeless rain? Do you ever stop and ask, is it all going to happen again? Do you remember that hour of din before the attack? And the anger, the blind compassion that seized and shook you as you peered at the doomed and haggard faces of Do you remember the stretcher cases lurching back with dying eyes and lolling heads? Those ashen gray masks of the lads who once were keen and kind and gay. Have you forgotten yet? Look up and swear by the green of the spring that you'll never forget.